I think the first sign is... So the big question is, what are top agents doing to absolutely crush it in real estate, grow their teams and add more transactions year over year while so many struggle? To get the answers, we interview the top real estate agents to learn their secrets to success. My name is Andrew Dunn. And my name is Peter Michael. Welcome to Elite Agent Secrets. Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Elite Agent Secrets Show. Today we've got Timothy Rist with us. He's been in real estate for eight years and sold over 550 homes as a solo agent. Now, something even more impressive, in my opinion, is in 2021, he took a six month sabbatical and he still sold over 40 homes in the six months he was working. He's now just decided to open up his own indie brokerage, and he's going to be sharing more of that in topic two. So you've got to stick around, everybody. Timothy, how are you doing, my man? Thanks for jumping on the show. <laughs> doing great. Thanks, guys. So uh, Happy to be here. This, this, this one's going to be a fun one, because as we started chatting off air, we just started unwrapping a layer after layer after layer. And we were like, holy crap. You know, taking six months off, we got to we got to figure out how the heck you were able to do that and still start in the brokerage and close over 40 deals when some agents aren't able to close four. Right. Yeah. So, Tim, g- give us a little bit of context, though, before we start wrapping up and going deep into your um, topics. Take us back to day one. What did that look like? How did you even get started in real estate? Day one, uh, I was 21 years old. I had just come out of uh, running a construction company. That's how I put myself through college. And um, I had a a broken back and a herniated L4, L5 disc, which is what pulled me out of the, uh, the construction industry and had some friends who were trying to get me into real estate. And I was like, well... It's, it's not going to be working with my body. So it's probably a smart progression for me being that I was already having health issues in my early twenties. And so, um, day one was, was a train wreck. My first six months in real estate, it completely sucked. I sold like maybe two homes. That's still um, not bad. That's yeah, not like, yeah, I know. I guess, I guess, uh, I shouldn't say I was a train wreck. I was, I was like, picture, like I'm I, every day I'm managing this like intense level of chronic pain. So I'll sh- I show up at my desk and I'm, uh, I've got like this, um, you know, side, if anyone who knows about herniated disc or sciatica, probably all of your listeners and in, in their forties and fifties are familiar with this. I just got acquainted with, uh, I got acquainted with it early. And, uh, so I'd show up and I'd be like on muscle relaxers or whatever, just to try to like get through the day. And I remember multiple times falling asleep on my computer, waking up and just like seeing a J, 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 J repeated across the screen where it's supposed to be lead generating my notes, whatever. So anyways, um, sold a few homes. I didn't actually see the upstairs of the first two homes I sold because I couldn't walk upstairs. Um, but then, wow. uh, then I, I fe- spent my first commission check on an MRI. That's when I found out that I had broken my back and herniated a disc and just didn't, didn't address it. So then I sent my second commission check on back surgery. And then that's basically as soon as I got, as soon as I got back surgery, that's when my, my business exploded. I sold 27 homes my second year in real estate and I doubled, sold 60 homes or no, my second six months in real estate. So I sold about 29 homes my first full year. And then I sold about 60 homes my second year in real estate. Then it just basically kept growing to the point when pre-pandemic 2018, 2019, I had a large team and we're selling 150, 160 homes a year. Jeez. Jesus that Christ. That is a hell of a story to start with. Like you got your first commission check was to get your back MRI and your second one was to pay you for the surgery and you couldn't even see the upstairs of the homes. I'm sorry, listeners, but you listen to this and you ain't selling a fucking home. I don't give a shit. Like, you ain't just no, sorry. Ain't that there's no excuses. Like, you just, the chances are you're struggling. You ain't struggling like that struggling. Like, that's a whole other fucking level of, like, I'm making this work. <laughs> well, I yeah. want. Wow. When you were on those appointments with your buyers, were you just like, tell me what the upstairs is like? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I'd sit on the, I'd sit on a landing and I basically like walk in the house and I'd sit down, um, on the floor and, uh, it was super humbling actually. It was like, I had really great, I was lucky. I mean, I honestly, I got lucky. I had this, this really gracious clients that were like, yeah, you, we can tell you're just a sack of shit right now, but we're going <laughs> to still shop around with you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would, I would, you know, they, they could just kind of met me where I was at. I would, I'd yell upstairs, right. you know, or I'd call them as they're walking around upstairs and, um, check the corners for mold. Yeah. 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 What's the, how big is the mat? Is the top, is the, is there a bathtub up there? You know, I remember it was Casey Kuas. I remember that so well, she was walking around and she's like, the bathroom's great up here. Like she was just, I don't know. It was, it was really it was actually really an amazing introduction to real estate, honestly, even though it was filled with pain and anxiety and all the things that go along with, with starting the business. I, I just got lucky with the right clients. Yeah. How did you find those first two? That was going to be literally my question. <laughs> uh, I, it was, I just had the advice to call through every one of my contacts. And by the time I made it to the C's, I mean, through the A's and the B's and by the time I made it to the C's, I got my first referral and it was one of my buddy's moms and she was buying her first place. And, uh, wow. So it yeah. really did come good for you. Eh? Yeah. I, in a, in such a bad situation, it's just like, I don't know if you believe in God or it's kind of whatever it is, but it's like, holy hell to be in that situation to not know what's going on and manage to get deals, get your surgery. And then the difference between no surgery two in six months with surgery 27 in six months <laughs> that's yeah. the difference it was that's- it really was and and to be fair it was the second half of the year so you know i, I was lead generating that entire time and so yeah. it was just you know how that re- there's that real estate timeline where the activities we do now won't show up for three months yeah sure and so i was able to reap a lot of the benefit of the the ramping up that i had done in terms so of, speaking uh, of the lead generation side, how yeah. were you doing that? And because I, I was going to say, you know, how did you get to, you know, from the two to the twenty-seven, and then from the twenty-seven, obviously to the sixty? Like yeah. these are big leaps in volume. How were you going about generating the leads to see that increase in volume? Uh, all grassroots, con sphere, knocking on doors, listing for sell by owners. Really? Yeah, those are the three. Holy hell, that's pretty, pretty incredible. And then you went on to grow a team, but you're now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're now a solo agent again, or? No, I, so I have a, it, here's, here's the interesting model. So we talk about, we talk about the, uh, the brand agnostic referral network. So I, I mentioned I took six months off and still closed a home, a bunch of homes. Yeah. It's because I converted my, my business to a referral network. I was a part of um, a few big brokerages and decided to go and hang my license independent. Yeah, I still maintained relationships with people that I had had as team members and people that I had built up in the business. And so uh, I just basically turned my my sphere into a referral network. And especially as I had clients moving to different parts of the state, yeah. uh, I relied a, a huge amount on referral business. And um, that ties into to the the managing burnout topic. That mm-hmm. well, uh, let's dive into. You, we yeah. talked about. Let's let's start start as we kind of mean. So let's dive into kind of. I guess the last six months sabbatical is potentially. I'm guessing to do with burnout. So your first yeah. secret to success is managing burnout. So tell the audience more why that's your first secret to success. Yeah, um, it's more my. I guess a better way to put it probably is it's more my first secret to failure. Um, cause I feel like success for me has just been getting through the failing with as much forward momentum as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and with, with as much, uh, with as little repeat learning as possible. Right. So it's like people ask, well, how did you, how did you do it? Right. How did you sell 500 homes in seven years basically? And build a team and double, I've doubled the business three times in a row when I first started. So every year I doubled for, for three years straight and then plateaued around 150 transactions a year for, for several years in a row. And, 
and and then I did get burnt out. I mean, that's really what it came down to is like I, I was was completely overworked. It was totally untenable, and unmanageable, and you know i i had uh, I had fallen into the 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 age old trap. Uh, Jim Rohn called, I think, or not Jim Rohn, who is it? Jim Collins wrote uh, How the Mighty Fall, right? And Mm -hmm. um, full transparency, I never read the book, but I heard a teaching on one of those tenets, which is the undisciplined pursuit of more. And that was my, that was my philosophy. That was my theology for, for lack of a better word was I'm just, you know, I, what am I doing next year? I'm doubling the business because that's what I can do, right? That was my, that was my why, that was my driving force. And so then as my life got a little bit more dynamic, I welcomed a, a child into the world. Uh, and then the pandemic showed up and all of a sudden it just kind of revealed all of the fault lines that existed in what I had built, what was not sustainable Burnout became a mixture of just being overworked, unsustainable habits, et cetera, and having it revealed to me all the work that was still there to do, right? Like I've got this great business, I've got I'm making all this money, but there's fault lines. And suddenly it's becoming apparent to me that in order to really move to where I want to go, I have to implode like entire parts of this building that I've been building, right? And some of that, some of that came down to, um, you know, making one of the hardest decisions of my life to pull the plug on a, on a marriage and, and the, you know, kind of implosion that goes along with that. Right. I mean, I had five businesses you know, a rental business. I had, I was flipping properties, doing developments, running a real estate company. And so, uh, (laughs) managing burnout, uh, you know, I don't even know if I believe in that actually terminology, um, being aware of burnout is, is really the first secret there and, and being aware of it before it's, before it's too late. And it requires you like, there's a difference between having to kind of do a partial remodel on something, right. That you're building and making some adjustments versus like, it's on an improper foundation and you just keep building and building and building to the point where it's like, well, the only way, to fix this is to take it down on the ground and restart. And that's what, you know, in terms of managing burnout, I guess to, to, to translate to the lessons learned there, it was, I, I was so out of touch with myself that I had not even given my per- self permission to acknowledge how burnt out I was. I just can, kept working because that's what I did. So when it comes to, you know, managing burnout. And I think acknowledging it is maybe a better way to <clears throat> say this. What are some of the things uh, there will be people in the world for sure. People listening to this show who don't know it's happening. Cause they are just like head down, just going to keep working yeah. from your experience. You've dealt with it now. And, you know, I'm not sure whether you say you've overcome it or you've learned how to look out for it or deal with it. But what would you say is some of the signs that people should look out for that, that, that they are really starting to get burnout and they, they need to kind of reevaluate? That's a great question. Um, so I think the first sign is uh, I call it active disengagement from the business. So you're like in, in, in the case of a team leader, they find themselves um, disengaging from their own team, you know, whereas a leadership model for me was I'm, I'm showing up first, like I'm the first one to show up in the day and the last one to leave, right? I'm really leading from the front. Uh, and where I start finding myself finding reasons to not show up at the office, avoid connection with my team, like starting to distance myself from those relationships uh, where maybe you find yourself like it's a social gathering and you just want to have a break from the people you work with. Right. Yeah. You start anytime where there's resentment that starts to set in where it's like every time your phone rings, you just like are, are like, you know, say a four letter word on your breath. That's a good sign. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> sign that you're, you're, you're actively dising or maybe passively disengaging. Right. So you start passively disengaging and then active disengagement is more when you're, when you're like, you, you maybe your subconsciously start self-sabotaging because you're like, 
you're so burnt out that you you just don't want the the uh, pressure to manage so you're building and at the same time sabotaging yourself because it's like the channel and I, I coach clients now like i coach people in real estate and you know the the push in this business is always lead generate lead generate lead generate well sometimes people don't lead generate because they don't want any more clients like yeah they don't want to be poor but they're actually they're actually overwhelmed by the chaos of their life, by the lack of systems and processes in their business, by the lack of good, good help or good leverage within their teams that they're like, they're just taking clients that call them, right? They're taking clients and, and I'm sure someone can relate with this. They'll, they'll take the referrals and low hanging fruit, but if it's not like super easy walking into their lap, they're just not, not growing and they're playing a dangerous game because it's not sustainable. At some point you stop marketing you stop listing, you won't last. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that <clears throat> with people saying like the, I think it's interesting how you delineated between passive and active. Like yeah. one is kind of, maybe you don't realize it and you're going through your life. And then the other is like when you are basically deciding and making that choice. Yeah. I, a lot of this I was doing, I'd love, because this definitely goes along with this topic. I've got this kind of thesis, I guess, on overwhelm. And I think this is one of the biggest things that people struggle with in real estate is actually overwhelm, which is because they're getting told to go knock on doors and cold call and do mailers and then do TikTok and Facebook and YouTube and or whatever it is. And they're getting pulled in so many directions. It's so overwhelming. And we've all been here. I've definitely been here where you get to your day and you go, I've got all this to do. And you literally do nothing. Like you just sit and you're like, it's so fucking overwhelming that like you've got all things to do and you got to do nothing. I remember studying and I, you had days like that. You're like, I've got all this shit to do and you just can't do any of it. And you just feel like this paralysis yeah. around that. And for me, I feel like, I'm not sure what, you, again, what you think about this, but I feel like the people that somehow learn to manage that overwhelm are the ones who are on that fastest route to burnout because they, they like progress with it Mm. like irrespective of what their body and mind are telling them they're kind of trying to do everything failing at everything so it's so overwhelming everything's getting shit and then all of a sudden the whole fucking thing implodes on him yeah and that's when they hit burnout reset and they are just done they're like i'm out Uh, the breed is ain't for me i'm done and i think that one of the things that we struggle with as an industry is as an industry there's a, a, a severe lack of education and then there's also, in parallel, too much information. Mm-hmm. It's such a weird dynamic because it's like, you can go on YouTube now and find everything, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's so much out there, and you try to do this and that. But like the reason we coach, we coach agents, right? Yeah. The biggest thing about coaching, the biggest thing agents get from coaching always is accountability. Mm. It's mm-hmm. the fact that you stand by their side and you make sure they're doing their shit and you make sure they focus on one thing because yeah. then they get results. I yeah. can tell everyone who's listening right now, cold calling as much as we hate, we don't do it. It works. Door knocking, it mm-hmm. works. Mailers, they work. Facebook ads, they work. Facebook groups, they work. YouTube works. TikTok works. Instagram works. <laughs> all yeah. of these fucking things work. But if you're trying to do them all, none of them will work. Right? Yeah. And you'll yeah. fucking hate your life. So... When it comes to like your experience with overwhelm, because as well you touched into like managing five businesses, man, like I, I would find that overwhelming. Like yeah. I only ever managed two at once, and they yeah. were very similar, which is how I kind of convinced myself that it was okay because the uh-huh. systems in the back end was almost identical. It yeah. was just was servicing a different clientele. Yeah. So what do you think about that? What do you think about overwhelm? Huh. Yeah, it, it uh, the the, on, the onion for me had to be peeled back a few layers for me to understand why, like, why I felt the need to, to 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 grow so fast and and frankly so recklessly, um, and it came down to um, so Colin Powell has a quote uh, that's been an important one even into this year for me. Uh, which is to never let your ego be so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. And 
um, like I had been, <laughs> I'd spent many iterations, like trying to understand my own egoic self and like what's, you know, it, it, the reality is that ego exists for every person, right? Ego is essentially our, our sense of self. And so the interpretation of that was you're going to have an ego. You're, you're going to have a sense of self. If you outsource that sense of self to the wrong thing, or you put it close to some other kind of external measure of value, suddenly when that external measure of value is no longer measuring up, it falls, right? Then you're in a, you're in a, you're in a bad spot. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're suddenly going to lose, you're going to, you're going to lose a sense of self when the thing that you put your sense of self in goes away. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I think it was mismanaged ego. That, that meant you went down that rabbit hole and that yeah, just, yeah. I put it? like, I put my, I, I outsourced my sense of value to, to my ability to, to build and grow businesses. Um, and, and, and I, you know, it became kind of a, kind of an addiction to that, just building more and more and more. Um, and, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky addiction because it's glorified, right? It's not like yeah. the, it's not like the addiction to, to, to drugs or alcohol that, you know, eventually starts, you know, it's still, it still ruins relationships, but it it, uh, it looks good from the outside, right? Cause you're making a lot of money and you're building and growing and having influence and still able to write big checks to charity. And, uh, at the end of the day, it just was, it was just miscalibrated. Why, you know, having a driving force to be like, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to do now for me, managing burnout is as simple as like, I got back to surfing and getting outside and doing things I love and building, building my time budget. Like I have 168 hours a week and, like how I spend that time is the most valuable thing to me. Uh, I'm not like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to live each day to the best of my ability. I'm going to live, live each day as if it's my last, which means if I'm not feeling passion around something, I'm going to really be critical as to, do I really have to do this? Is there another way? Right? Like if I'm, you know, like my lead gen, I just don't, I don't lead generate anymore. I build relationships and I cement relationships and it's, it's super scandalous. And, and, uh, you know, it's, re, it's involved me completely changing how I do my real estate business. But, um, of course I, of course I, you know, I get leads, right. And I convert them. But yeah. when I get on the phone with people, uh, I'm, I'm building relationship. And if it circles around a real estate, I mean, I have powerful closing questions and scripts or whatever, but I'm, I'm ha if I'm not having fun, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I'm really not interested. <laughs> and I, th I find myself fortunate to be in that because I have gone through enough grind and hustle to be yeah. able to have like a 500 person sphere. So don't get me wrong. Like there is sometimes you just have to lower your head and grind it out. Yeah. But, um, to me, like surfing is like, a, it's about catching waves. And so where do I, where do I actually feel momentum? Where can I be in flow versus being in grind? And I think that's the key to managing burnout is where, where do my unique values, gifts and relationships facilitate flow in my life versus where am I trying to grind against the stream unnecessarily? I love that. Do you do you sometimes walk away from opportunities that you thought would as were good, but they're just burning you out? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because yeah. switching your business, right? I mean, you drastically yeah. switched your business because the, your business was burning you out, even though you were yeah. doing a lot of volume, a lot of transactions. Yeah, you just walked away from it. I mean, you walked away essentially from what it was to an outside world, a cash cow. Yeah, but it wasn't yeah. a happiness cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like after doubling, right. Three years in a row and then maintaining at like 160 transactions to put in perspective, the pandemic hit and I cut my volume in half twice a row, twice in a row. So right, I went from 160 units down to 80 units in the year of the pandemic, then down to 40 the following year. And, and some of those being referrals. So if you like follow that path down, some of that was, uh, you know, ironically in 2020, I was also uh, more profitable, even with half the volume.
So how, how do you manage? I mean, there's a fine line of managing the burnout, but then also knowingly you're walking away from hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. How like, I mean, to me mentally, I feel like that would destroy me in a way. Oh, but you it, must have been in such a place where you were like, I don't even fucking care. Fuck yeah. Oh, this. yeah. Yeah. I'm out. It was yeah, it was a pretty intense, uh, pretty intense anguish. And um, I mean, Mike Tyson, so just do you remember, he's earned, what was it, 400 million? And like, yeah. he's now just got what he's got. Um, you know, he's not going to be poor, but he's not what he was rich. Like, he was the richest, highest paid fighter was in the world at the time, whatever it was. And he was like, the happiest I've ever been is now because he's like, now I've got nothing. No one wants anything from me. It's just me and my kids. Yeah. It's like, it's the happiest I've ever been. The guy had 400 fucking million dollars, like cash. Yeah. Like we're not talking yeah. about an assets and shit. Like he got paid $400 million, you yeah. know? And he's like, I'm the happiest I've ever been. Yeah. No fake friends, no bullshit. I get to do what I want with who I want when I want to do it. And he's like, I just want to hang around my kids. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so, so from like a tangible solution driven for anybody that's listening, that is burning out. What are some of the tactical things like, maybe assessing the situation, some of the things that you've done when you were like, okay, cool, this is my stopping point. Here's how I'm, how I'm going to deal with this situation. Here's how I'm going to manage it to make sure that at the end, I'm taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, so two things come to mind. One is the... Uh, if you were to I'm going to write this down because this is super okay. important. So for anybody listening. <laughs> so this isn't down. new. Yeah, this isn't new. I'm, I'll, I'm just going to just share with you everything I've stolen from people way smarter than me. How about that? Love right? it. Um, Love it. R&D, baby. Rip off and duplicate. Yeah, yeah here we go. So um, Stephen Covey in, in Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, uh, which is like the, the Bible of success, really. Um you know, his, his proposal to begin with the end in mind uh, took a dramatic turn for me when I thought about being a dad and thought about not only, you know, what I, I've got to think about my own epitaph. So taking the time to like write out, like, what's, what's my eulogy going to be? And, you know, kind of doing that, doing that uh, semi crude exercise of drawing a tombstone and writing, writing, writing your epitaph in full, you know, how you showed up, what you remembered as, and, and then doing that again, if you were to die today, what would that read? And, uh, I didn't like, I did not like how it read. So that was the first thing is like, okay, something's got to change because I'm, I'm not happy with what my eulogy is going to read at this point in time. So I need to begin with the end of mind. Let's just say I'm starting over. I've got to recalibrate this thing to be stoked about however this eulogy is going to end up because this, you know, I might believe in God and an afterlife, but I also am aware that this could be it, right? Like I, we, no one really knows what comes next. And there's a chance that this is all we get. That's a, that's a possibility. That's a possibility, which suddenly brings a level of, <laughs> of urgency and importance to every hour that we spend, like every moment we're alive, how we treat people, how we leave people like I'm not leaving them better or leaving them worse because of knowing me and, and working with me. So there's the tactical is just, is just do ask you're going to, we're going to, we're going to make money and have quality of life in direct proportion to the quality of questions that we ask ourselves and others. So there's, there's, there's your one line zinger. And to me, I just took all this like, hard, painful, horrible questions and turn them all inward and went through actually multiple years of asking myself and re-asking myself really challenging questions. And it did look like recalibrating too. Um, you know, like it's, it comes down to how I show up as a dad and, and, and the awareness that even like the, the marriage that I was in was, was almost preventing me from showing up as the father that I wanted to be. And my way of like taking responsibility for my life was actually doing something that defied all my core values, which was stepping out of my marriage. I was like, it was, it was, uh, 
not, it was so, so much the heart, like letting my businesses implode was, was an easier decision than walking away from, you know, a nine year relationship. Um, and so, you know, that's, and it was really unpopular because I, I just being totally transparent, like, and this is the real life stuff, right. Where, you know, I'm, I grew up in a super Christian environment. All my business is in a really, you know, in a really kind of like, uh, church related circles. And so I also, by making that decision, like lost whole components of my community and friend groups and everything because yeah. divorce was not a part of the acceptable philosophy in, in places where I had built my, my sense of community. Right. Yeah. That's, and so, yeah, it was tactically, it was like step two, be real about where you're leaking energy. Right. Like if you've got, if you're, if you're in a toxic relationship, how long are you going to be able to make that work? Really? Yeah. Right. Like when you, when you can only do you and you've got to, you've got to roll with, with, with a, with an energy leak in, 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 in house, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how, how some people pull that off. I try, I gave it everything I got and it wasn't enough. Um, so tactically, identifying leaky energy. And, and then I think the step three is, is taking the time to, to love on yourself and, and date yourself and, and, and like be a whole person uh, outside of business. Right. So if, if my identity is outsourced to, to my growth as a business, what happens when I wipe all that away and now I'm just given a, p- a blank piece of paper and I'm saying, okay, nothing to nothing I've done in my life matters anymore. It's a new day starting from yeah. this moment forward. I've got nothing I can hang my identity on. There's no, there's no hanger that I can just like put my hat on and say, I'm valuable because I did this. It's yeah. all going to be based on the measurement of today. Then that gives us the chance to, I think, uh, reset where we hang our ego right or taking colin powell's advice it gives us the opportunity to recalibrate where our ego stands in relation to the things that we use to bolster it and um, these are important yeah absolutely yeah. oh and by the way would you consider yourself a maverick are you an agent team leader broker owner who's constantly striving pushing boundaries and smashing goals well we've already helped over a hundred agents cross a hundred thousand dollars and up in gci per year So if you're interested in learning more about our courses and coaching to help you scale your business, then head over to go.eliteagentsecrets.com.